the image here is a um, is by Aura Sats. It's called the Spiral Sound Coil. So the paper I'm presenting um, to you is the uh, third uh, third of a three part. Uh, what will be a chapter of a book called Appalling Melodrama, and I've actually presented the two other parts of previous tuning speculation events, so um, it's kind of like the de facto patron of this project. Um, so I'm happy, I'm happy for the case. It's really for, the, for these events that I've written this. Um, and so this part of the Appal so Appalling Melodrama book is about the intersection between love, um, uh, music, and horror, and um, it involves commentaries on the life of, uh, passages from the life of Christina the Astonishing, Mayor Baba, and H.P. Lovecraft. And so this, you're getting the, um, the last part of the Christina the Astonishing commentary. Um, and there, it's a um, moment uh, in the uh, Vita that describes a practice that she would do more than, more than once, which would spit, she would spin in a state of ecstasy and then kind of collapse, and the sound would emanate out of her body. And I'm using um, this passage as the, um, kind of the ground for um, uh, a theory of action. I'm calling it a musical theory of action. Um, and so to understand you know, the, sort of, uh, the, the, um, the line of my thinking here, I'll just say a little more about that. Um, one, I'm correlating action with the, with the order of love as it moves from gross, subtle, uh, and mental spheres. And the three forms of love which are proper to each of these spheres or worlds are lust, longing, and, um, and uh, resignation or surrender. So um, for today, we're going to be focusing on, that, um, on, on the nature of surrender. So the passage in question... Um, for today is then a wondrous harmony sounded between her throat and her breast which no mortal man could understand nor could it be imitated by an artificial instrument her song had not only the pliancy and tones of music but also the words if thus I might call them uh, sounded together incomprehensibly the voice or spiritual breath however did not come out of her mouth or nose but a harmony of the angelic voice sounded only from between the breast and the throat, so in this, um, in this region. In this third stage of Christina's astonishing activity, the sounding of wondrous harmony from her quieted body corresponds to the state of the lover in the mental sphere, where, as Mayor Baba explains, love expresses itself as complete resignation to the will of the beloved. In this state, while still subject to the abyss of duality, Selfishness is utterly wiped out, and there is a far more abundant release of love in its pure form. The increased purity of love in the mental sphere is seen in the fact that here only about one-fourth of the original lust of the gross sphere remains, but it remains in a latent form without any expression, not even subtle expression. That would be like, uh, like a fantasy or imagination, I think. Here one is free from the possessive longing, which is typical of the lover in this subtle sphere. So to clarify the continuing synthesis of love and action in this third stage of the saint's movement, listen to the resonance between its renunciative musical release and the three criteria of true action, which I defined, um, which I defined earlier in this project, which are specularity, intelligence, and musicality. First, Christina's sounding is specular in the sense of being a reflection of something uh, deeply beyond within herself, just as the voice, a verbo-musical image of divine intelligence, reflects the specularity of angelic being. The angel is an image of God, writes Pseudo-Dionysus. He is a manifestation of the hidden light. He is a mirror. She sounds as mirror of the angel, who is mirror of God, and thus in the act of reflection, the self-same mirror. The wonder of this harmony, which now sounds like a wolf tone, <laughs> is not simply a matter of becoming its medium, but of her body and spirit unfolding into being what is communicated. Such is the moment of sounding, of her limbs singing all of a sudden from the depth of their own stillness. 
she became quiet in all her limbs, and hence there sounded. And the text doesn't really explain it, but that moment is so interesting. It's just, the moment of the quieting of the limbs is the moment of this sound emerging from her body. Likewise, action is not only grounded in the agent's need for self-disclosure or manifestation, but in the necessity of spontaneously discovering that one indeed already is, as per the Nietzschean imperative to become what you are, whatever one's action is seeking. As Dante says in the Convivio, he who, he who paints a form, if he cannot become this form, he cannot portray it. And this means not knowing or surrendering all ideas as to what you are, following the whim of the universal dialectic, whose movement is the essential activity of creation or the universe, from who am I to I am God. As Nietzsche says, to become what one is, one must not have the faintest notion what one is. God is the name of the unknown one who is the only answer to the question of itself. There was a man, says Meister Eckhart, that man had no name, for that man is God. Second, the act of Christina's sounding is intelligent in the sense of being a freeing of itself from itself. And this is basically what I mean by intelligent action is action that frees itself from itself and action that achieves freedom or that achieves, um, that realizes liberty. As all life is an effort to attain freedom from self-created entanglement, so is the wondrous harmony an effect of letting go the effort which brings it forth, a loosening of involvement with her own members. Everyone is familiar in one way or another with the interpenetration of attainment and surrender, the arrival of striving into its inverse, which forms the moment of fulfillment. Or as Dante's Virgil explains, this mountain is such that it is ever more difficult at the bottom, at the beginning, and the further up one goes, the less it gives pain. Thus, when it shall seem so easy or sweet to you that going up will be like floating uh, downstream in a boat, then you will be at the end of this path. Intelligent action proceeds through imitation and habituation only to arrive into the inimitable and spontaneous. Third, Christina's sounding is musical not only aesthetically, but by virtue of being a beautifully unbounded release of the formless into form, as per Mayor Baba's definition of the only thing ultimately worth doing. To penetrate into the essence of all being and significance and to release the fragrance of that inner attainment for the guidance and benefit of others by expressing in the world of forms truth, love, purity, and beauty, this is the sole game which has, uh, which, um, which has any intrinsic and absolute worth. All other happenings, incidents, and attainments in themselves can have no lasting importance. Similarly, the saint's spinning appears literally to drill into that transcendently imminent depth of another world, this one, secreting thereby not so much some thing, and not not a thing, seeing as we are actually talking about it, as the openly secret truth of its own reverberating presence. So true action results not only in concrete results or objects and services, but in something seminally unfor unforeclosable. As Agamben says, the beatitude of a potentiality that comes only after the act of matter that does not remain beneath the form, but surrounds it with a halo. Poor old tone. <laughs> Everything is resonating now. Um, in sum, the third phase of Christina's spinning shows forth the circular nature of action as search. Circle, circus, search, all these words are from Kikro, the uh, Indo-European root, which means to turn or to bend. The shape of its place within the universal gravity of this whole cosmic carnival which moves us, as Dante says, like a wheel being moved evenly by the love that moves the sun and the other stars. Whom do you seek? Every creature, says Mayor Baba, in the world is seeking happiness, and man is no exception. Seemingly, man sets his heart on many kinds of things, but all that he desires or undertakes is for the sake of happiness. But happiness is not a thing. It is a being. Why do you seek the living among the dead? Luke 24, 5. And being is a verb, a spontaneously breathing kind of musical word. I and myself am one who, when love breathes within me, take note 
and to that measure which he dictates within, I go signifying. Something born without whence or whither. The wind blows where it wills, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know whence it comes or whither it goes. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. John 3, 8. A sounding and a hearing, that which each other is of. Uh, so Christina's song, the, mu the music of an amorously panting spiritual breath, like that of the psalmist panting heart, uh, as the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you. That's a famous line from the Psalms. Um, so her breath releases the essential fragrance of action as the search for its own source, a finding found in the exhaustion of agency, as per the beautiful Indian fable of the Katsuri Nirga, or musk deer, who spends its life in search, of, for, in search for the origin of its own scent. At last, happening to lose its foothold on a cliff, it had a precipitous fall, resulting in a fatal injury. While breathing its last, the deer found that the scent, which had ravished its heart and inspired all these efforts, came from its own navel. This last moment of the deer's life was its happiest, and there was on its face um, uh, inexpressible peace. Where are you going? If there is one thing I want the rest of this commentary to achieve, it is the abolition of achievement, the erasure of the entire illusory realm of de de determinable results. Life, reality, everything, whatever you want to call it, is infinite. And anything which has the nature of an intended result, other than that infinity itself, is in the end only another dead end or a stepping stone to something new. In the end, and in the beginning, and the middle, one simply attends forever to this unlimited tendency, the whim of reality itself. As Eriugena says, since that which human nature seeks and towards which it tends, whether it moves in the right or the wrong direction, is infinite, and not to be comprehended by any creature, it necessarily follows that its quest is unending and that therefore it moves forever. And yet although its search is unending, by some miraculous means it finds what it is seeking for, and again it does not find it, for it cannot be found. So you can see how Christina's spinning um, fits, it has a kind of, um, kind of analogical relationship to this idea of the circularity of a search. I mean, her, her activity is just to spin and sort of spin out of control and then kind of, and then kind of collapse and she finds something, but she also, she also doesn't find it. It's just a sound that comes out of her. And in fact, if you read the rest of the story, she doesn't, she's only kind of partially aware of even what happens and she only learns from her, from her, from her companions, you know, about this sound that was coming out of her body. There is no escaping the inconsequentiality of consequences, no permanent not laying down the endless burning, burden of requiring results. There can be no realization of infinity, says Mayor Baba, through the pursuit of a never-ending series of consequences. Those who aim at sure and definite results have an eternal burden on their minds. Eventually, the inexpressible peace of falling into finding that there is nothing outside of oneself to seek simply takes over. The divinely fatal destiny of a most glorious futility, one which renders all efforts worthlessly worth it. Man cannot escape his glorious destiny of self-realization, and no amount of suffering that he passes through on the way to it can ever be too much. <laughs> In the breathless sonic outcome of the saint's desperate spinning, I therefore hear a form of oppositionless protest song against the presumption of results, a music refusing via surrender whatever forms of will would claim to force themselves into reality. As love and coercion can never go together, Christina's harmony embodies the canticum cordis, or song of the heart, a concept by Jean Gerson from the 14th century, the song of the heart which cannot be forced whose unforceable power goes on sighing and singing regardless of outcomes, and before whose faith the intellect eventually, so staggered by the vastness still beyond it that it will be forced to admit the hopelessness of its quest, is finally constrained without coercion to bend. As Ladislav Klima says, but what the mind does not believe, the heart does, and in the end the intellect does too. What else is left for it to do?
and Batai, the human being arrives at the threshold. There he must throw himself headlong into that which has no foundation and no head. And Leopardi, what is life? The journey of a crippled and sick man walking with a heavy load on his back, up steep mountains and through wild, rugged, arduous places in snow, ice, rain, wind, burning sun, for many days without ever resting, night and day, to end at a precipice or ditch in which he inevitably <laughs> falls. <laughs> Everyone surrenders. Everyone surrenders. You already have. It is too late ever to have not. Far too light speedily late even to have ever been. Headlessly singing straight through her heart, Christina's uncanny instrumentality speaks the horizon where surrender and expression converge in a manner pointing theory and practice into the hopeless necessity of their shared freedom from consequentiality. Here we hear with ears cut off from our noisy mass hallucination of mastery over or condescending supposition of determination of results. Yes, results follow and do not follow acts, we know that, but the only kind of action which does not ruin either is that which constantly says no to, which never stops letting itself go into letting go of their eternal burden. I never make plans, I never change plans, said Mayor Baba. It is all one endless plan of making people know that there is no plan. Like the final happiest moment of a life fearlessly wasted in search for itself all the time. <laughs> Inimitability. Um, what is this sound which cannot be imitated? This definitely indefinite quidam harmonia mirabilis coming from the saint's body. How does its know-not-what quality correspond with the nature of action as it moves according to the spectrum of love through the gross, subtle, and mental spheres? The answer to these questions lies in the unitive convergence of state, place, and experience in the process of love-ordered action, a convergence which in turn discloses the nature of inimitability as the spontaneous fusion of these categories. I have just a small doodle here, which is an attempt to portray something about these. I'm kind of imagining these three kind of intersecting categories, kind of a spiral Venn diagram, I guess. But each one is like a vortex, and the soul or path of experience is sort of spinning around these three you know, vortices, but eventually finding the place where they all converge them, themselves. These are the three main terms here. Uh, the inimitable, wondrous harmony of true action is just this, phenomenologically not some supernatural sound, but the musical synthesis manifesting where one's state, one's place, and one's experience converge without reduction, opening via each other into higher unities. Ibn Arabi said, there was not a single star left, and I married every one of them with greatest spiritual pleasure. <laughs> then I married the moons. In the moment of movement's fulfillment, as glimpsed in the purity of a gesture or peak experience, wherein the separative boundaries of self, body, and world are broken down without obliteration, there is found that intensive self-sufficient oneness, which fulfills Augustine's definition of music as, quote, the science of moving well, such that the movement is desired for itself, and because of this, delights through itself alone. <clears throat> This is why, as Charon says, music alone gives definite answers, because it per se echoes the infinite, unclosed def definiteness of divine reality, the natural truth, knowledge, and bliss of the one who perfectly is its own free activity, just as, as Eckhart says, the just man serves neither God nor creatures, for he is free. And the closer he is to justice, the closer he is to freedom, and the more he is freedom itself. Music per se, but definitely not just any music. Um, inimitability here is not a problem of deficient skill, not a question of potentiality, you know, being able to do something or not. Everyone knows how to be crucified like Christ, or spin like Christina. What potentiality does not do, here like potentiality says, I don't go there, I don't go there. 
What potentiality does not do is do it the way the one who does it like that does. Christ ina. Meaning that the inimitable concerns this utterly as if too ready-made aspect of a being whose experience is its place and state, whose state is his experience and place, whose place is her state and experience. Um, Ibn Arabi wrote, O oh, marvel, a garden amidst fires, my heart has become capable of every form. Now one is back in that most mystical sphere of potentiality, not doing what you can do, which is normal activity, nor not doing what you can do, which is impotentiality or suspension of your act, nor doing what you cannot do, which is a miracle, nor not doing what you cannot do, which is just being in a state of idiotic rest, <laughs> but something more astonishingly, astonishingly inimitable and bewilderingly simpler than all of these, doing what you cannot do by not doing it. Singing what I cannot sing by not singing. Mayor Baba explains how places, states, and experiences are interlinked in the gross world as well as on the inner planes. In the physical realm, the distinction and relation between the categories is clear in the way a change of place brings a change in the state of mind, and both of these result in a change in the nature of experience felt. On the inner planes, which is the state of consciousness where the soul identifies with, with its subtle or mental body and is consequently aware of subtle and mental worlds, the boundaries become less discernible but remain, as intimated in dreams where the place, mental state, and experience with which a person is confronted do not have the same externality or separateness which characterize them in wakefulness. You're in your dream, and your dream is also in you, and you are the place of the dream, and the dream is the experience of that state, and so forth. Similarly, in the divine hallucinations of the subtle planes, as well as in the spiritual nightmare of the mental plane, there is a growing tendency towards fusion of the experiences which are normally separated from each other in gross wakefulness. But on the seventh plane of, of self-realization, where the soul now knows itself through itself and not through the mind, the integral fusion is so complete that there we cannot have any places, states, or experiences. Life there is lived only in its indivisibility. Integrity of place, state, and experience is of the nature of reality, just as purpose, there being somewhere to go and something to achieve, is of the nature of illusion. Purpose presumes direction, and since existence, being everywhere and everything, cannot have any direction, directions must always be in nothing and lead nowhere. Hence, to have a purpose is to create a false goal. Love alone is devoid of all purpose, and a spark of divine love sets fire to all purposes. The goal of life in creation is to arrive at purposelessness, which is the state of reality. Arrival... Uh, purposelessness coincides with realization of the indivisibility of place, state, and experience. The erasure of their imaginary relationality, the reflective vectors through which the whole shifting mirage of goals makes its appearance on the life horizon of inherently purposeless reality. The relative separation of places, states, and experiences familiar within the material domain is actually a product of imagination. For it is precisely through the imagination of places and states that mind experiences its own experience. Mind is subject to imagination. It imagines and experiences imagination through places and states which, which imagination creates. Just as in the gross world, there are places, states, and experiences, there are also imaginary places, states, and experiences on the subtle and mental planes. Yet in both cases, they belong to the illusion created by imagination. The imaginary nature of experience via imagination of places and states is clear, for example, when you see an image and conceive of it as being there, the object of your subjective experience, when in fact it is no more there than not. A dark room is not black and not not and so on. Now consider how thoroughly one's sense of purpose and attachment to results, the whole field of thinking and feeling that someone individually and or collectively is going somewhere or getting things done or not, 
is entangled with the mutual conting contingency of place, state, and experience as opposed to their integral fusion. Everywhere we are bound, in, bound up in thinking that the achievement of one requires or results from the other, always forgetting the imminent reality of their unity, alienating one from the other exactly so as to maintain the illusion of control, um, the illusion of control over and or culpability for results. In contradiction to the ancient common sense from Bhagavad Gita, you have a right to your actions, but never to your action's fruits. Act for the action's sake, and do not be attached to inaction. The wise man lets go of all results, whether good or bad, and is focused on the action alone. Imagine Christina taking credit for her inimitable harmony, or being disappointed if it did not sound. Imagine whatever the hell you want, anything you think has the power to make you happy or unhappy. In reality, no one really cares how things turn out the way they think or claim to. One is simply watching the whole thing, bound by identification with a largely self-created drama, without which you would seemingly have no place, state, or experience, nothing to be and nowhere to go. As a witness, Mayor Baba says, the soul remains aloof from all events in time, and the results of actions do not bind it. All this has to be experienced and not merely thought of, because no one really knows what to do, because one really does nothing. As soul, it does nothing. It merely is. When the mind is added onto the soul, it appears to think. When the subtle body is added onto the soul with the mind, it appears to desire. When the gross body is added on to these, the soul appears to be engaged in actions. The belief that the soul is doing anything is a false belief. Bodies, whether material, subtle, mental, they all move and feel and think like puppets of a master who never lifts a finger. Seeing that, how much labor, work, action is actually grounded in the fear of doing nothing, of one's identity with purposeless existence, of being a soul who merely is. How much investment in results is really the perverse confessional performance of this, essentially in, this essential inability to plan anything, properly speaking? How much so-called responsible action is simply the illusion it maintains for itself? The fact is, as Mayor Bob explained during the fiery free life, intellectual planning turns out to be a planning mostly in name containing in it only as much truth as is necessary to justify the players in feeling they, that they have had a real share in the entire game. Nothing works out. Everything. Our mass hallucination of mastery over and our slavish dependency upon results may be termed the great human or M.E. peace plan. A plan placing oneself in the middle of everything, in the Middle East of everything, by permanently insisting on conjoining these irreconcilable principles of plans and peace, as illustrated in an anecdote about a man who visited Mayor Baba in 1937. Now tell me, what do you really want? The man answered, I want to serve my country, but a disappointment in a sad love affair frustrated my plans. I want to fulfill my plans and have peace of mind. Mayor Baba responded, plans and peace, these two can never go hand in hand. Where there is peace, there is no plan. Where there are plans, there is turmoil. Either give up plans and have peace, or have your plans and give up thoughts of peace. You can't have both. It's impossible. People suffer because they want the impossible, the unattainable. You want to stand in the fire and at the same time don't want to get burned. Burned. You want to build a house in a graveyard. In actuality, and you will know them by their fruits, as Jesus says, in actuality, this plan, the plan, of the M.E. peace plan, turns out to be only the cover of its own shadow, the non-plan of its own endless plan B, which is to fret over things um, going or not going your, your way, to remain lifelessly living in the burning graveyard of reserving rights to results. I have a reservation. That is, the great M.E. peace plan is in truth the means of the opposite of both, the bad spontaneity of a status quo where inner and outer turmoil, worry and war are maintained as ever-present, indispensable, immediate options. Such is the plan whose diurnal installation results in the self-destructive world of all too imitable action, 
the omni result, which it is precisely never too late not to produce. As Vernon Howard said, anything you look forward to will destroy you, as it already, as it already has. That's the omni result of the ME peace plan. Okay, here the inimitability, getting to the end here. Here the, inimita the inimitability of Christina's harmonic spinning throws me, ME, full circle into a horrifying and for that reason most happy intuition. That what Wordsworth called the savage torpor of the human sphere of inharmonious activity, the world which fails to fulfill true actions, three criteria of specularity, intelligence, and musicality, is the direct result of one's own personal misuse of action itself. A misuse which is the intimate opposite of the saint's hyper-useful whirling. For the nature of false action is to generate not wondrous harmony, but a distracting noise within and without oneself, not the repose of surrender, but the perpetuation of movement for its own sake, and not insight, but intentional blindness to action's own nature. So I'm going to conclude uh, with this nice clip by just a, about four minute clip of Vernon Howard talking about, about unintelligent action. So I'll give him the, the final word. How should I? How do I play the MP? Okay, it started. Oh, it's playing. It's stuck. Oh. Do you have another Jeff Quick time or something? Mm -hmm. So, were you planning to play that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, it's, so it's perfect that we need. <laughs> Is this something off the internet? Because I can play it. Um, it is on. It is. It is on the internet, yeah. What is well, presently, or it's not on the internet? It's not on the internet now. Oh, okay. I mean, it is on the internet. It's also, also on the internet. <laughs> but I can find it on, I, I think I can find it on the line. Where is it? He didn't get rid of his doubts because he was doing something. Let me ask you whether you were doing this. He was doing something as follows. It is called action without intelligence. It is called action without understanding. It is called action for the sake of creating a whir in the mind, a noise, a vibration, so that you don't have to hear, you don't have to see what you don't want to see about yourself. And let me tell you, as if you don't already suspect it, let me tell you that the world is hurtling forward with unintelligent, destructive action for the sake of action alone, and no wonder it is in the condition that it is in. But, but if you don't want to go along with the world in this destructive race down toward the swamp, if you don't want to do that, I've got some very good news for you. <laughs> you can begin to slow down the action of your mind and of your feelings and of your total life. You can begin to slow it down so that you can see where you are going wrong. You can see very individually that as an individual, you must begin to go against the way the world works. you're brought into this world the world grabs you it takes you and does what it wants with you and you don't know any better nobody does because the world is so fierce in its action without insight and everybody 
in the shallowness praises movement. Political, religious, educational, social. In the family, let's do something. Let's go somewhere. Let's act. As if action is salvation instead it is ruination. Where are you going to find one human being? Where are you going to find one man or woman who will say, just a minute, what are you talking about? <laughs> Praising physical, mental, emotional movement as if it is a virtue in itself. I'll repeat the question, where are you going to find someone who will question it? Nobody wants to question it, because if they did, they would have to give up their foolishness, they would have to give up their pretense. And do you, do you believe what I'm going to tell you next? They would have to give up their self-destructive hurtling downhill. The cry, the wail of the human mind is, Give me something to do so that I won't have to think intelligently about what I'm doing. Give me something that has a lot of bells to it, a lot of trumpets, a lot of noise, a lot of headlines, a lot of racket. Now let me ask those of you right here now, watching and listening to this. Would you have the courage to begin to slow down your life so that you can begin to question where you're going and what you're doing so that eventually something would come to you that you could see as clearly as you can see the sky, clearly see that you have been moving along without any thought of, at all about where you're going. Thanks. <laughs>